Andrea, that's a fish. Um, my name is Andrea Robertson. Um, I have been in science communication for about 10 years, um, and I've worked on and off in various nonprofits for a total of seven years. And in both of those roles, I saw a real need for um, nonprofits to get a better handle on data being able to understand the data that they have, and then be able to communicate it or use it in communications with the world. You know, as everybody starts getting all hung up on metrics and big data and, and stuff like that, it, you need the ability to use the data, understand the data, and work with the data effectively. Um, so, seeing that niche, um, I started my own company, Hipsipops. And um, because that's not really a common name, um, it is the Latin name of the California State Marine Fish, the Garibaldi. And now you know. <laughs> so today I'm presenting data visualization for nonprofits. So sort of expanding on really the latter half of Stephanie's um, presentation in looking at various options um, for illustrating different types of data and how different illustration styles serve different messages better than others. It'll make sense in a moment, I hope. Um, but in nonprofits, I've found that there's three major categories of types of data communication. You can be explaining an issue, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, um, there's impact reporting, so how your program or proposed program um, had an impact, sort of the before and after, uh, and then financial reporting, you know, the annual report, um, and possibly end of project reporting as well. So we'll go through different options within each of those three categories. And as my sample data set, I went to City of Vancouver's open data treasure trove and found a data set on bike rack locations in Vancouver. So we're going to learn about bike racks tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll pretend that we are advocating better bike rack accessibility uh, in Vancouver. Um, that's an issue. But first, we need to choose our message because different illustration styles serve some messages better than others. So we need more bike racks. We need more bike racks at X location. The rate of rack installation has slowed recently. Um, bike racks are unfairly distributed in the city, and there's plenty of other messages that you can use um, that data set for. Uh, but just these four messages, each one is really asking for a different thing in the data visualization. So we need more bike racks. That implies a number, so you're going to be working with a quantity. Same with bike racks at X. That's a quantity and a location, so you're probably going to bring a map in. Now, Excel doesn't do maps, I know, but um, there are a lot of free or very nearly free tools online um, that can help you do uh, web mapping or print mapping. Um, and I have a whole list of tools at the end of the, the presentation, so we'll get to that. Uh, but we'll skip it for now. Um, rate of rack installation, that implies uh, change over time. So you're going to have an element of time in your messaging. And finally, um, bike racks are unfairly distributed. Fairness sort of implies, um, well, if it's unfair, there must be some kind of fair, and the, the qualifications for fair, there's going to be a comparison between what we have now and what we would like to have. So different comparisons. Um, there's other types of messages um, that you could bring into your graphs. Um, the ideas of connection, um, just ideas in general. Um, and to start us off, for example, switch to fisheries, uh, which was my first um, area in uh, science communication. So this is salmon harvests in BC for a little over 100 years. And it's a bar chart, stacked bar chart for half of it. Um, and it's something that everybody's seen. I put this up here, and you look at it, and how many of you have started trying to figure out quantities yet? Like going back and forth with the y-axis, because I didn't clean it up like Stephanie told me to. And 
um, you're, you're starting to focus on the nitty gritty, the quantities in each of these columns, how they compare. You're sort of missing the forest for the trees. If my message is, look, there's been a big trend, a big change over time, you may not have noticed that things went down towards the end there. That's because bar graphs invite you to start making comparisons and start lining things up. If that's not what you want your reader to do, bar graph might not be the best choice. This is the same data in something called a stream graph. A stream graph is like an area chart, um, except it's been detached from the x-axis. What is an area chart? An area chart is a line graph that everything under the line has been filled in. So it's like a line graph that's been filled in and then allowed to detach and float up um, across this uh, horizontal line in the middle. By doing this, um, you are still showing the year-to-year -year variations. So all the data is still there. And this is actually uh, from an online interactive piece. So in the live version, you can actually hover your mouse and see the individual data points. So you're not hiding any data, nothing shady. Um, but by presenting it in this way, you sort of invite the reader to look at it differently. Now the reader kind of sees, oh, more or less the same until something different happens at the end of the graph. But I promised bike racks, so. Um, changes over time. Average annual rate of rack installation has slowed recently. Um, this is a line graph. Everybody seen a line graph? We just talked about them, so I'm gonna skip through them. There are variations on the theme, though, from the basic line graph. This is something called a spark line. And I'll flip back and forth a couple of times so you can see how things have changed. The years, I've bumped up with the data labels, and you'll notice that one of the data labels has disappeared, that 148 and 2014. Um, spark lines are, you usually highlight the beginning number, the end number, and any high and low points within, just so you're, you're providing the minimum viable product, the minimum amount of information that the reader needs to understand your message. Now, this one only has four data points, so it's not the greatest example of this. This is a graph I did um, from a project about halibut. This is halibut quota prices. Um, and you can see that over this 25-year history, we started out at around $5, ended up a little over $71. Again, you can still see what happened in the intervening years, but for the purposes of this message, uh, this point, they're not really important. Um, so you just highlight the bits that are important, little strategic labeling, some coloring, um, and it's, it's a very quick and easy way for your reader to see, oh, big change over time. Cool. Um, the issue of comparison. Uh, so Stephanie went through bar graphs, so I'll make this part quick. Um, we have north-south roads and east-west roads, and apparently the north-south roads are getting a disproportionate share of bike racks. Um, so bar graphs are really easy to, uh, to make your comparisons. There's the donut chart. I am not against donut charts. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, you can quickly see the 40 to 60% split um, in bike rack distribu distribution. Then you start getting into annotations. This is a row chart, so a bar chart flipped over sideways. Um, but now I'm starting to add a little more information. So the average number of bike racks per road type, just over 1,000. And you can see how things match up against that, um, that benchmark. Uh, I am a big fan of annotating graphs. I mean, you want to do it strategically. You don't want to turn them into chart clutter. Um, but because graphs are a visual tool, um, people, when people are reading a report, they often skim through, they'll read the headings, they'll read the bold text, and they'll look at the pictures, including the graphs. So if you have a really important message, and it's not really fitting in your headers or your bullet points or the bold text, consider putting it on your graph. Again, in a strategic, well-planned well way. Um, but 
graphs are not ha hallowed ground. Uh, this is a more compressed uh, version of a bar chart. This is something called a bullet chart. Um, and this one provides a little bit of context. So you can see that there's different rankings in the gray behind the big orange bar there. You know, that certain amounts of racks are okay, good, and awesome. Um, so you can see how this east-west roads number matches up against those benchmarks. And we'll see this bullet chart appear in a bit. Um, as far as annotations go, uh, this is probably the most passive-aggressive graph I've ever created. <laughs> I've created a few. Um, <laughs> this one is talking about the number of boats uh, in the halibut fishery. And that's probably all you need to know to understand what's going on. And I'll get out of the way. Um, because this is a self-contained graphic. Imagine seeing this float by on your social media. You would understand the story, at least this little tidbit of the story, uh, without any extra information. You would see that somebody claimed there wouldn't be fewer boats, but the line did indeed dip into the danger zone. So by using color and by using text on the graph and annotations, um, you can give a more complete story. Uh, and again, a self-contained independent story. All right, this one's pretty cool. I did not do this one. So there's two books, um, two authors. Cormac McCarthy wrote Blood Meridian and William Faulkner wrote Absalom, Absalom. And they have two very different writing styles. Cormac McCarthy writes in very short, terse sen sentences. And Faulkner rambles on, you got your commas, your parenthetical phrases, totally different. And a uh, data scientist named Adam J. Calhoun wanted to illustrate somehow these differences. But how do you do that? How do you graph a writing style? He decided that he would look at punctuation. So here's the punctuation in Blood Meridian and Absalom, Absalom. Um, well, it's clear there is a difference there, but it's kind of boring. I mean, it's a bar chart. Bar charts get the message across, they're very effective, but they're kind of boring. So, a different approach, he just went straight to the data. <laughs> if you have a creative way to present your information um, and it still gets the point across, don't feel obligated to jump into Excel and start, start graphing. There are perfectly valid other ways to illustrate your point, your message. I really like this one. <laughs> Um, speaking of can't do it in Excel, uh, this is a good example of using analogies um, to get the point across. Uh, normally, I would say to stay away from irregular shapes because, you know, looking at this, do you sort of draw a line between Maine and Minnesota and that becomes part of the 9%? Or At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. The point is that there's a tiny red dot where all of us are hanging out. Um, but by using something that people are familiar with and connecting your data to that familiarity, um, you can get your message across a lot more effectively. That's something, again, in common with um, general communications. Uh, use things that people are familiar with to communicate your information. So what if you have information about connections? This is starting to get into qualitative data. Um, which is data that you can't quantify or put into numbers. Um, at Ecotrust, uh, we did a, a study about the different values that come out of commercial fishing in BC and interviewed a bunch of fishermen, and these are the different values that they mentioned and the different ways that those values are intertwined. Um, this is a diagram called a chord diagram where each... Um, each uh, value has the connection. It basically shows that everything is intertwined um, and we described it as a web of values in BC. Unfortunately, this is also something you can't do in Excel, but Excel is involved 
because you do need to prep some of the information in Excel before you head online to some of the online tools and finish the job. Oh, the, the connections, yes, this is actually a, a still photo of um, a, uh, an inter interactive diagram, and on the interactive diagram, you can hover your mouse over any of those sections of the circle around the outside, and it'll actually highlight all of the branches that come from that circle, so you can see those connections and how big they are, how strong they are between the pieces. If there's time at the end, I can show you the interactive versions, but it's not normally something Excel does. Um, then finally, also in the connections idea, there's something called a network diagram. Um, you've probably seen these if you, you know, graph your Facebook friends or LinkedIn connections where you're a dot and then your friends are dots and there's lines and it kind of becomes a giant spider web out from there. It's not just for Facebook. Anytime there's a connection, you can illustrate that. So this one is actually, again, from fisheries. Um, a connect shows dots and connections between fishermen, their fishing licenses, and their boats. Totally not Facebook, but it still works because it makes almost a map of the, uh, the fishing industry, the salmon industry in this case. Next, we have impact reporting which again is sort of the before and after of your programs and projects. And because of that, um, impact reporting really is meant to highlight transformation, highlighting the change that your organization and your work brought about. So you can you know, brag to funders and donors and keep things rolling. Um, that means that you're probably gonna involve metrics. You can't make up metrics at the end of your project. You do need to plan ahead. Um, think about the sorts of comparisons you're going to want to make and collect that data ahead of time. Uh, before and after comparisons, these transformations can be very powerful in external communications, funder relationships, but you need to make it happen like, from the beginning um, for it to work. But as with any graphing, um, you want to make sure that you choose your message, choose the emphasis on that message, so whether it's a comparison or quantities or change, um, and then choose your graph. So this is sort of a straggler variation on the line graph. Um, this is something called a slope graph, and it's just literally the before and the after. Um, it's the start point and the end point. This is back to the bike rack data set, and you remember there were a few other data points in there. Um, we removed it just to highlight you know, the snapshot in 2012 and the snapshot in 2015. Make sure you're not doing anything shady by removing the intervening points. If something happened in the middle, it might be best to keep them. But these can also be um, very, very useful for huge amounts of data. For example, uh, this is something that was printed in the New York Times. The full version is on the left here, but this is sort of a close-up of the top section. Uh, and it talks about um, gender equity in various industries. And they're looking at 1980 versus 2010. Um, and I guarantee that each of those lines on that graph did all sorts of wiggling up and down during those 30 years, but that's not important for the message that they're getting across here. The important part is that some went up, some went down, and it's inter interesting to see which ones those were. And these are actually quite easy to do in Excel. Um, it's just a line graph, and then you start messing with the settings and alignment um, and relationships. Sometimes um, you can't put things into numbers, into data. Uh, so if you're doing something like a survey after you uh, have an event um, or an education program and people give you these wonderful quotes, first of all, using wonderful quotes on their own 
is totally fine, and that's also really effective, as you probably know. Um, but you can also make them into the classic word cloud. There's a lot of um, free, really easy word cloud generators online. Um, so don't forget that they exist. One drawback with word clouds before I continue on is that remember they are removing the context with those words. So what does bike rack mean for you? Convenient. You could have someone say, bike racks are totally not convenient, but you'd never know it in this word cloud. Um, so have a look at your, as with any graphing, have a look at your data first, decide if it's appropriate, but word clouds are often a good option because people understand them, they've seen them around a lot, and they're eye-catching and inter interesting. You can kind of, you know, turn your head back and forth and see what else is in there, and they're engaging. Um, a lot of nonprofits do before and after surveys, sorry, surveys in general, um, where they ask for qualitative responses. You know, I thought something was very good, kind of good, kind of bad, very bad. Um, and it's really hard often to show uh, that information, those results, in an easy way. Uh, the bullet chart is back, uh, and you can use the background context there uh, to, show, to show what the final score there, what that final average is, what that means. So in this case, it ends up in somewhat good. Um, and it's, it's quick, easy, doesn't take up much space on the page. Um, and it is self-contained, as long as it comes with the, uh, the question, it is a self-contained bit of information. I believe the response was what? <laughs> um, the dot plot, um, uh, as Stephanie went over, um, does show before and after as well. Um, if you want to show that change, that transformation, whether it's positive or negative, um, and it also doesn't take up a lot of space on the page if that's a concern for you. And then, of course, we start veering into infographic territory. Um, if, say, 422 bike racks were built in 2015, you can find a symbol to represent a certain number, in this case, 20 bike racks, and start making an array. This is especially good if you want to show the sheer number of something. You know, 500,000 people experience whatever. 500,000, that's a lot of people. Um, so, it is sometimes visually interesting um, to make an array of, of uh, icons here to, uh, to show what that sheer number really looks like if people have a tough time um, sort of wrapping their heads around it. Even still, I still think it's perfectly valid to just put a big old number there. <laughs> just say it, 422. Depending on the situation, um, depending on the size of the number, people may just have a better um, a better feel for the number if it's if it's just printed as is. And finally, financial reporting, the most exciting of them all. Same three steps. Oh yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna pick on EcoTrust Canada because I did their annual report. Financial page, looks like everybody else's. Um, there are a few things going on here uh, that help the reader understand the table, even though it doesn't look like a table that you would print out of um, Excel, there's still a lot of, um, well, it is still a table. Uh, so you have alignment, you have um, the fact that all the text is pushed to the left here, all the numbers are pushed to the right. That makes it a lot easier for people to skim down and read the numbers. Um, numbers in particular, you never really want to shove to the left, oh, backwards for you, shove to the left or centered um, because you know, we sort of, in a way, read numbers from right to left based on the number of places that are filled. So make sure they're right aligned. Um, if 
categories are subcategories of something else, indenting them, and then over on the expenses side, the far side over there, that's a pretty big row of, uh, of numbers, or column of numbers. So there's some spacing. In this case, every five, um, there we are, every five entries, there's a bit of extra space so that visually somebody reading across kind of keep their place, like, oh, I'm two above the gap or three below the gap, and, and they know where to look. But there are other ways to illustrate this. So looking, sorry, this is um, current year's numbers and then the previous year's numbers over there. So if we're just looking at one year's worth of numbers, there are ways to illustrate this that might make the financial statements more exciting for your readers, if that's a thing for you. Um, there's row charts. And remember, row charts can go positive and negative. Um, and this is uh, an easy way for people to skim down and immediately see that, whoa, contracts and consulting, a lot of money there. Um, that may or may not be something that you want to highlight for your, uh, your reader. Uh, but if it is, that, that can make things go a lot faster. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, in that case, we can get to tools. Um, all of these slides are going to be available for download, um, I believe, through Eli, but I also have them on my website. Um, so don't feel obligated to copy them all down right now. Um, I'll explain a few of them, though. You're familiar with Excel. Python and R are um, statistical programming languages. Python um, tends to be used more by industry, and R tends to be used more by academia. So if you're, if you're going for it, you've decided in 2017 you're going to learn a statistical programming language, choose wisely. <laughs> um, Adobe Creative Suite, that's Illustrator, Photoshop, the whole gang. Um, the ones underneath are freebie versions of Adobe um, in case you don't have the vast amount of money it takes to pay for them. So GIMP and Pixlr are both Photoshop equivalents. And Inkscape and Affinity are both um, Illustrator equivalents. If you are into making infographics, static ones, um, there's Canva, which is pretty fun. Um, and Picto charts. I have not used that one personally, but I've heard good things. Um, and then there's more being released all the time. So there's a lot of options out there. OK, these are two of my favorites. The Night Lab puts out awesome free tools intended for journalists, but you're telling stories too, so it counts. Um, all you have to do is know how to use uh, Google Spreadsheets. And with them, you can make the top one there, Story Map, is an interactive map. So you can tell a story um, like, OK, I was born in this year, in this place, and then next button. Oh, and I went to school here, next button, and I did this. And, and sort of a guided tour of a map of your life or your organization's work or what have you. Um, timeline is an interactive timeline. Pretty straightforward. But you can make it multimedia, both of them. Actually, you can make multimedia. Photos, videos, SoundCloud, lots of cool stuff. Um, if you're into making interactive graphs and charts for your website, Google Charts um, has some really interesting, fun, free tools. Uh, and then for a small fee, there's also Infogram, Data Wrapper, Chart Blocks, a lot more. Uh, many of them offer nonprofit discounts, so always be sure to ask. Um, and again, if you're Getting into programming languages, there's also JavaScript. Uh, D3.js is one of the industry standards for interactive data visualization. Uh, it's one that I use a lot, and I highly recommend it. And finally, how-tos. Stephanie had a much better list, so refer to hers. <laughs> um, but inspiration, uh, the world. Um, but that's true. I mean, consider, start to think about what makes a graph successful, 
and what makes it unsuccessful? What do you like about certain graphs? What do you hate about them? And, and really consciously look at every graph, and you can start picking up clues and tips along the way. Um, other great places, d3js.org, that is the home of that coding library. But even if you're not learning JavaScript and this library, they have this amazing opening page of just thousands and thousands and thousands of data visualizations of all different types. So it's great just for inspiration alone. I lose many hours there clicking on things. Um, New York Times and Washington Post do awesome work. Um, and then Pinterest, Dribbble, um, anywhere graphic design uh, showcases are found. Uh, you'll start to find data, uh, data visualization and information design there. And that's me. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes? I do have one. It'll take me a moment to pull it up. Um, if anyone ever wants to play with um, interactive data visualizations, hold on, can I type and talk? It is, especially with a microphone, hearing myself. Like, you sound really awkward. <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, what was the question? Night Lab, yes. And, oh yeah, and I was saying about EcoTrust, um, I did all the stuff on this page. They're all interactive, so you can play with them. I think they're fun, but. Um, EcoTrust's 20th anniversary was, hey, in 2015. Um, so, to commemorate that, we made a time, uh, timeline for them. This, oh yeah, the other thing about Night Lab stuff is it's all automatically responsive. So you can just plug it into your website, including WordPress. It plays very nicely with WordPress, and go. Um, but with this, you can either click the side-to-side -side buttons and check out fun stuff, or you can scroll through, uh, scroll through here and say, I want to see that. Wow, they had an airplane. Does there need to be a really advanced, fancy programmer to make this happen? Absolutely not. These tools, Night Lab's tools, we're designed for totally not programmer journalists. Um, so you do need to be able to operate a spreadsheet, and you do need to be able to follow directions. But other than that, no, anybody. And I, they're I great. This one works where it's like the description links the picture on Flickr. It's like three calls. Yep. They give you a template. So you just kind of fill in, fill in the blanks, um, hit go. And then it makes a thing for you. And they're really awesome things, too. And you can customize certain elements. And if you do feel more comfortable with um, code, you can customize a lot more. But even the basic version has some really awesome features, does some really cool stuff. Anything else? Yes? The, oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. If you ever go to this web page, um, this particular report is all about um, uh, non numerical information as I scroll past the one numerical chart. <laughs> there we are. Okay. So this is a chord diagram, C H O R D. And with this, if you hover over any one of them, you can isolate, in this case, education. Um, you can isolate the cords that come off it. Sure. So um, the story is that uh, the commercial fishing industry does more than earn money for these communities. It, it plays a much larger role, and we wanted to know exactly what that role was, all the, the many facets of it. So we held interviews and we listened for different things that the fishermen and community members told us. And any time they said, in this case, the bottom one there is intergenerational, 
Say they said, you know, oh, I, I go out with my son and my grandchildren, and it, you know, in the case of First Nations, it really connects us to our culture. Well, that's a connection between intergenerational and culture, and so that would be a tick in that box. And over time, over many, many interviews, um, we compiled all of these connections, and out of that made this chord diagram. So you start with the chart. Mm -hmm. Um, this particular one I did in D3, which is not user-friendly. There are, however, I want to say Tableau Public might have it, those of you who use it. And the Tableau Public version is free if you're willing for your, um, if you're okay with your data being shared publicly. Uh, yes. Uh, email's better, but yeah. <laughs> so, let me make it a little bit more leading. Okay. If I wanted to hire someone intelligent and smart about this, <laughs> are you one of those people? I like to think I am. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I do, I do information design, um, so that's everything from research to data analysis to uh, data visualization, graphic design, and the final communication. And I work with organizations, mostly nonprofits, at any step or combination of steps in that flow. Um, there's not one go-to place. There are a few. Um, you could try online freelance sites, things like Upwork. Um, if it's more the design side and less the analysis side, like you already know what you want and you have the numbers for it, it just needs to happen. Um, then something like 99designs uh, could be a good option. Um, yeah, there isn't really one hub which I kind of wish there were too. <laughs> Craigslist. Hashtag data viz, or so I'm told. I'm taking a break from Twitter. I had to do communications at my last job, so I'm getting over it. <laughs> Any other? Good. So we're nope. coming in towards the end. We probably have time for one last question before we move to the next phase. Perfectly normal, don't worry. Um, yeah, well, there's, uh, at the end of the, the slideshow there, those few on that list um, are really excellent, um, the inspiration section. Um, otherwise, um, hashtag data biz. <laughs> everyone's, always, <laughs> everyone's always sharing there. Um, I, my personal favorites are uh, the news outlets um, because it's a different way of understanding what's going on in the world. Um, and it's amazing what they can come up with for breaking news. Uh, also, um, Pinterest, it's not just for weddings. Uh, and um, the D3 examples page, that one that has thousands and thousands of examples. They're amazing. They're really um, really cool ways and, and different ways of looking at information and ways to illustrate that information that you wouldn't, wouldn't really expect. Fabulous. Well, Andrew, that was super amazing. Thank you so much for walking us through that. Um, Thank and you. definitely data.ecotrust.tv.